In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Luhan, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so in this second meeting, um, we're going to begin to look at uh, the vows in particular. So today um, we'll look at poverty and chastity, and then um, thereafter in the, the following meeting we'll look at um, obedience and then our vow of slavery to Mary. And so to get in um, to the vows in particular, uh, we'll look first at, at poverty, you know, and always being mindful of the the end of, of the vows in and of themselves as means to arrive at a more perfect charity. Um, and so, in that vein, in our seeking after God, um, individuals are hindered by obstacles that we find along the way, um, either from, from without or from within. To find God perfectly, we must first of all be freed from every creature um, insofar as it keeps us back from the path of perfection. So as we look at these vows, in particular, we'll look at the nature, some different characteristics, um, some challenges to keeping the vow, uh, and then also some ways in which we can educate fidelity to them. Um, so the nature of poverty, St. Thomas teaches that to reach the perfection of charity, it is necessary that a man wholly withdraw his affections from worldly things. Now, the possession of worldly things, he says, draws a man's mind to love them. For it is one thing not to wish to lay hold of what one has not, and another to renounce what one already has. The former, says St. Thomas, are rejected as foreign to us, whereas the latter are cut off as a limb. Therefore, it is that in the attainment of the perfection of charity, the first foundation is voluntary poverty, whereby a man lives without property of his own. According to the saying of the Lord, if you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. So some characteristics of the vow of poverty. We can again remember that perfection does not consist essentially in poverty, or nor any of the other vows, but in following, in the following of Christ by perfect charity. And as our constitutions remind us, at, at one time our hearts um, sought that, or had that intention uh, to, to follow our Lord, to respond to His call in a pure and simple manner, uh, and to to dedicate our whole selves to Him, our lives. Um, as the, the, the Constitution say, on one particular day, these words of our Lord, sell your possessions, provide yourselves uh, with nothing else, and come and follow me, they spoke to our heart, and we decided by the grace of the Holy Spirit to follow Christ, who Himself was poor on earth, and through the vow of poverty, Religious can seek um, this path of perfection. Constitutions then indicate four main degrees. First, by abstaining from possessing something as one's own. Second, by depriving oneself of the superfluous. Um, so just being content simply with what is necessary. Third, to prefer for one's own use and to choose whenever possible that of least value or least pleasant, or least comfortable. And this says the, uh, the Constitution where, is where uh, the perfection of poverty begins. And then lastly, for the love of God to accept with joy privations of necessary things for the sake of holy poverty. Therefore, in a sense, we can boast like St. Paul, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fasting, through cold, and through exposure, we... We served our Lord. In addition to being a means to pursue perfect charity, the vow of poverty offers a testimony that acquires particular importance 
in a materialistic and consumerist world that accepts, at least in practice, the primacy of having, which is what our um, the directory on consecrated life indicates, so that in addition to um, freeing ourselves from attachment to things and allowing ourselves to um, dedicate ourselves entirely to God, it also is a testimony to the world that um, that sees its total progress or its perfection in possession, in having. And so therefore we offer an important testimony through the vow of poverty. Moreover, we discover through actual poverty that it is a suitable and the preferential approach that Christ chose for his disciples as they were to announce the kingdom of God. He said to them, take nothing for the journey neither walking stick, nor sack, nor food, nor money. And so as I was looking at, um, at this vow, uh, I, you know, as we're in the, uh, an, an ongoing formation meeting, um, I thought to look back at our dispensa on, uh, in spirituality, on consecrated life. And in that, there's um, some good counsels that, that are highlighted that I kind of wanted to just go through um, obviously this is when, you know, we received this course early on and, um, I think it, it's, it makes a lot of sense to look at it, uh, some years removed from it, obviously, depending on, on how long we've been in religious life. And so in the dispensa, it says that poverty is an austere virtue. So acknowledging that, that it is something that demands renunciation and sacrifice, and therefore it has internal and external enemies and it calls um, these these risks or these dangers as forms of anti-poverty and there's I just selected some of them uh, for points for examination or just to even think about that these are temptations that that continually and will continually creep in and so one of them is the natural inclination to possess something as one's own, so a form of anti-poverty. Uh, the, the possibility of acquiring a worldly spirit, which is opposed to the gospel. Um, also the pride that flees from or runs from those things that, that lower us or that per perhaps humiliate us. Um, the very comfort that flees from the annoyances of poverty, the bad example of the environment, uh, in other words, the place in where we live, including um, the example of others. And so the dispenser says perhaps sometimes it's the, the, the tolerance of some superiors who allow abuses against poverty to pass without correcting them, or even um, the, the bad example of the superiors themselves in in, in sort of neglecting this, this vow and its practice. Another form of anti-poverty is living in material prosperity in the religious houses. So not safeguarding it in that way, even though there's um, material uh, goods available. Another is disorderly attachment to what is used, including pious objects. It says here, the, de the devil does not care if it is too little or too much, but that it is disorderly uh, in terms of our affection, so as to pull the religious's heart from, from what it really wants, namely to dedicate itself to God entirely. Um, another anti-poverty, form of anti-poverty, is to search with restlessness or too much anxiety for one's own comforts, complaining or murmuring when one does not have everything to one's liking, uh, or when one does not give one thing, or when something is taken away, or is given this time and not the next time, um, or even when things change. Uh, and it acknowledges that, above all, even though things may change in our life, it is important to note that Christ on the cross remains the model, and the vow has before God the same strength it always had. Um, we can kind of reduce all of these to maybe two general temptations. The first one is to is to sort of ask for things back. 
Um, we took the decision of leaving everything and then um, maybe it becomes a point where we think the work is done and now we are able to allow things to come back. My necessary things, my time, my place, my friends, um, my habits. And to just, you know, think about the the difficult step that was taken to walk away from everything, from family, from homelands, from um, from certain goods that, that an individual, you know, can can possess, that we walk away from that in religious life and and sometimes we allow things that are much less uh, to creep in. According to St. Ignatius, and we, you know, obviously we know through the spiritual exercises, riches are the first step towards all the vices, and thus the road to perdition. It is the first snares the devil sets to those he wants to snare into hell. And the second general temptation is then just to simply have a careless attitude. So sort of thinking that these are the goods of the community, so I don't have to worry about them. I can destroy them or lose them. Somebody else will take care of it. If I lose something, we have the means. I can just get another one. Or I can just ask somebody for it. I have a benefactor who can take care of it, even if I don't really, um, even if I don't really need it. Um, and so that just to, to bear in mind that also it's, you know, we we know how to take care of the things and be responsible for them. Uh, do I do that with the goods of the community? Um, St. Teresa of Avila summarizes these two temptations saying, Our nature is so subtle that it seeks to take back in one way or another what it, once, what it has once given. She, she continues, We resolve to become poor, and it is a resolution of great merit. But of what is superfluous? Yes, she says, and to make for ourselves friends who may supply us, who may give to us things we want or need. And in this way, we take more pains and perhaps expose ourselves to greater danger in order that we may want or lack nothing than we did formerly, formerly when we had our own possessions in our own power. And then she adds, or sort of ironically you know, mentions, or sort of points out the irony. She says, a pleasant way this is of seeking the love of God. We retain our own affections, the things that we like, the things that we want, and yet we will have that love, as they say, by handfuls. We make no efforts to bring our desires to good effect or to raise them resolutely above the earth. And yet with all this, she says, we, we must or expect many spiritual consolations. This is not well, she says, and we are seeking things that are incompatible with one another. So, she says, because we do not give up ourselves entirely and at once, this treasure, namely the spiritual consolations, is not given wholly or entirely and at once to us. And she goes on to say that you know, the Lord sort of like just gives drop by drop um, because we are trying to hold, possess many other things on the one hand and expect spiritual consolations on the other when these two things um, don't go together. And so if we reduce all of this to just a few words, it is to say that riches can really hold our heart captive. And last point on the on poverty is just to look at maybe a few points that that can help us educate um, evangelical poverty. And so before entering religious life, and this is taken again from the uh, dispensa, which has an, an interesting little point to begin here. Before entering religious life, some people have enjoyed a certain level of autonomy in the economic plane. So looking at two different forms of uh, where people come from, it says they enjoyed a certain level of autonomy in the economic plane or they were accustomed to get whatever they wanted. Others, on the other hand, find that in religious life they live at a higher economic level that they did from their childhood or in their years of study and work. 
Moreover, in certain cultures, families try to take advantage of what they see as a promotion for their children. So these two sort of extremes, on the one hand, the one who was independent, had his or her own money, and was able to use it freely, um, and also those that, that didn't, and find in religious life uh, a, a sort of cultural promotion, or economic promotion. And so the dispenser says, for these reasons, it is especially necessary to educate ourselves continuously, because maybe we're going to come from one side or the other, to educate ourselves uh, in evangelical poverty. In order to achieve it and to help the religious, attention must be given to the following aspects of poverty. And so these are just helps to, to continue to educate that, or an ongoing education in the vow of poverty. And the first is to live the virtue of poverty making the effort with concrete and humble acts of renunciation of property, acts of detachment that make the religious more free f for the missions. The second is to try to focus on the very life of Christ poor, that is contemplating, loving and following him, given that without this, the idea of poverty can really degenerate into politics or an ideology under the aspect of solidarity and just simply the desire to share things. But only a poor heart that follows Christ poor can be the, the source of authentic solidarity and true detachment. Um, another point to help educate would be um, to live poverty in fact and in spirit. Um, so to live poor doesn't just simply mean to save money, um, but it really means to, to store up one's self-treasure in heaven um, and, and forego certain, certain comforts and needs, thinking even about the, the temptations or the, anti, the forms of anti-poverty. Um, a couple more points of education is to, to give testimony to poverty in a collective form and helping as an institute according to the conditions of each place to provide for the necessity necessities of the church or in the aid of the poor who the religious should love with the love of Christ and there also should even be a mutual aid between the provinces and the houses so to, to have that I bigger idea of, of some places have a, a, a a more stable material um, foundation and, and maybe don't need to, to to have or spend as much and therefore it can be allocated to other areas of, of the world and the Institute. Um, and lastly, an obvious point, even though the Institute might have the right to possess what is necessary for temporal life and its works, all luxury and appearance of luxury should be avoided. Um, as we know, to live out our poverty, we give testimony, as Lumen Gentium says, a testimony that the world cannot be transformed and offered to God without the spirit of the Beatitudes. And so to conclude this point uh, on the vow of poverty, I just wanted to quote Blessed Joseph Alamano, who is the founder of the Consolata Missionaries and the nephew of St. Joseph Cafaso. He says, Jesus is our model. Therefore, we have to study him in order to imitate him. He was poor in birth, poorer in life, and most poor on the cross. This example should suffice to make us understand what great esteem we should have for holy poverty, especially with regard to ourselves, who want to and must imitate Jesus closely. There is nothing that should encourage us to practice this virtue more than the example of our Lord. And so we move to the, the vow of chastity, and um, here just wanted to begin with a few words by St. John Paul II in Pastores Davo Vobis. He says that um, speaking, and this is he's speaking about chastity and priestly celibacy, he points out that this should not be considered and lived as an isolated or purely negative thing, but as one aspect of the positive and specific and characteristic approach of being a priest, so something highly positive and, and um, 
something specific and characteristic of being a priest. Therefore, the immolation of chastity is not only to abstain from uh, or refrain from sins against the Sixth Commandment, but it is much more. It is a chaste heart, it is a chaste mind, it is a chaste body. And therefore, it is to say it is a person who shows preference to God um, and the things of heaven that demands a heart and a mind and a whole one's whole self dedicated uh, to to God and and His uh, and the building up of His kingdom. The nature of chastity. Thus begin by defining the term. St. Thomas explains that chastity takes its name from the fact that reason chastises concupiscence, which, like a child, needs curbing. Okay, uh, It is one of the, the evangelical counsels in which the power of grace uh, elevates love above the natural inclinations of the human being. And therefore, by this vow... One's body and natural affections are offered to God as a holocaust. Something that we know. So we sacrifice and give all of our affections um, and we surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ, directing all of our love to Him. As St. Paul the Sixth says in the Apostolic Exhortation, Evangelica Testificatio, he says, Chastity witnesses to the preferential love for the Lord and symbolizes in the most eminent and absolute way the mystery of the union of the mystical body with its head, the union of the bride with her eternal bridegroom. And finally, he says, it transforms and imbues man's being in its most hidden depths with a mysterious likeness to Christ. Um, and one more point on the, the nature of it, just... Returning to St. Thomas Aquinas, he says that um, in general, obviously, the, the religious state, and we saw this a little bit with poverty, the religious state requires the removal of whatever, whatever hinders man from devoting himself entirely to God's service. And so the vow of chastity does this, according to uh, St. Thomas, by working against our concupiscence, which really will drag our minds down towards lower things, which prevents the mind um, from what it wants. And he says, which is a mind with perfect intentness on tending to God. And the second reason is really just echoing the words of St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. He that is without a wife is solicitous for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please God. But he that is with a wife is solicitous for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And so, um, our constitutions identify that our victory uh, in, this, in this regard, our victory of ch in chastity, can, can have or attain various degrees. First is substantial, which is just eliminating serious sins. Or to, to, to arrive at chastity in substance. The second is perfect by eliminating even minor sins. And the third is triumphant, which is the most perfect, which explains our, our constitutions, um, number 56, that not only this obtains elimination of sins with maximum delicacy, but also goes beyond the mere avoidance of sin. And this can be done in regards to the promptness and also in regards to totality. So, in promptness, meaning eliminating every discussion or compromise with temptation. So, to not even negotiate with, with a temptation that, that, will, that, will, that will come. Um, but also, totality, meaning the immolation of the heart and negation of the passion, even in its indirect aspects which may not be strictly sinful in themselves. So, just to avoid those things that may tend towards a disordered affection. And we have to always remember that chastity is something that cannot be separated from the cross of Christ. It requires a daily conquest in the battle of life. And if we are not mindful of 
the spiritual beauty of the imitation of our chaste Lord, it will be hard for us to remain committed in the battle necessary to conquer it. So even just thinking of the education uh, of ourselves in fidelity to poverty and thinking about Christ poor, um, it's also necessary for us to to have within our within our, our, our hearts and minds uh, the imitation of, of our chaste Lord. What are some difficulties um, that can present themselves? Well, as as a human, it is almost impossible for the religious person not to feel a sense of compassion um, for those who appeal to his help and to his support or to his sympathy. And if the intention is not totally right, he will become conscious that the affections are can be, become too focused um, or they can begin to focus in a little, in a dangerous way. Um, St. John of the Cross speaks about this, so we can look at um, some spiritual authors to sort of unpack that point. St. John of the Cross in Dark Night of the Soul says, Some of these persons make friendships of a spiritual kind with others, which sometimes arise from the flesh and not from the spirit. This is the case when the remembrance of that friendship causes not the remembrance and love of God to grow, but remorse of conscience. If that sensual love grows, it will at once be observed that the soul's love of God becomes colder, and if the love of God grows, the other love becomes cold. And so he points out that the two are contrary to one another. Therefore our Lord said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. This is the difference, he says, that exists between these two kinds of love, whereby we may know them. And so we have to understand that our love um, should not be selective here below. The heart of the religious person grows like the heart of a mother or father for a large family um, that demands the love for all of the children. And so if that person reduces his love for one or two, perhaps those who sing his praises, he reduces the capacity to love to one or two. And so in our dealings with people, we have to keep in mind always the supernatural end, through him, with him, and in him. In our dealing with others, there is a risk to look for those who are agreeable to us, who are who are understanding, or who are consoling, or those who are amiable, just, or just even naturally delightful to be around. And we find ourselves avoiding the encounter with those who are harsh, more severe, who don't understand, or for the, towards those who are unkind. And if we think about it, if we do this in a certain way, we are not loving um, with Christ crucified, uh, because in the others we sort of look for ourselves and we don't look for Christ. The closer the religious draws towards Christ, the more he looks upon himself as serving in his name. In his book, Three to Get Married, Fulton Sheen develops this idea very well. He says, purity in the young, and this is so this idea of like, universal love versus specific or selective love. So he says, purity in the young who are destined for marriage begins by being universal and develops by being particular. It begins by awaiting God's will in general and then sees that God's will is focused on one individual. Once it is brought to great centrality in the union of two in, one, in the one flesh, then it becomes more universal again. He says, then it pays back creation from the particular to the universal again, giving in this universal love the gift of the family. In souls consecrated to God, purity is never focused on a particular person, he says, but is a constant tendency to universality by loving and praying for all men and each one as children of God. Impurity is the concentration on the individual without regard for the universal. It is the isolation of love from otherness, the utilization of tenderness for selfish ends. 
the turning in upon oneself of that which by its nature was meant to be outgoing. Impurity is introversion. It is a love of self-enjoyment. Impurity is a distraction from the universal end, the affirmation of the non-eternal. The isolation of one part of self from the totality of life, and consequently it is a deformation of life and the origin of death. And so, to reiterate this point in just another way, St. Teresa of Avila, she goes so far to say that this obviously brings great harm to the soul, but also evil will spring forth. She says in The Way of Perfection, you may think that there can be no harm among us in excessive love for one another, but no one would believe what evil and imperfections spring from this source. She says, the devil sets many snares here, which are hardly detected by those who are content to serve God in a superficial way. If we are inclined to care for one person more than another, let us control our likings and not allow ourselves to be overmastered by our affections. Solution is following the advice of St. Ignatius of Loyola. To make manifest the temptations to confessor or spiritual director. Uh, because especially in matters of chastity, um, this his advice applies. A temptation presented to the spiritual director is a temptation already overcome. On the contrary, if we trust in our own, our own lights, we fail to seek advice. Under the pretext that a temptation is not a sin, we can easily fall into the snares of the father of lies. And so just to summarize and conclude, uh, we can quote our constitutions, um, number 55. Imitating Jesus Christ, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We want to offer to God by the vow of chastity a holocaust of our body and of our natural affections, living the obligation of perfect continence observed in celibacy. This vow implies a preferential election of the exclusive love for God. Next week, we or next uh, meeting, we will look at the vow of obedience and then also uh, our vow of slavery to Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.